for a lot of people it's uh, difficult to make a change in their diet. Uh, they might have a struggle to give up certain articles of food that they cherish or maybe they just don't know how to apply the, uh, the, the will of God in their dietary plan. Well, for me it was pretty easy. Uh, at one time I was living in an, in an abandoned house, had no electricity, so all I could eat were things that didn't require a fridge or didn't require too much cooking. I was cooking on an open fire. And so I didn't have anything like meat or didn't have eggs or milk or any of the perishable items. All I could eat were thing, vegetables, really, that kept well, like carrots and potatoes and onions, things like that. And so uh, maybe I think I ate some beans and things as well, but not so much, and some bread. And so it was very easy when I came to understand the truth and they said, oh, you have to keep this diet. And I said, oh, I'll just keep on doing what I'm doing then. So it was very easy for me. But uh, obviously there were a lot of things that I had to learn how to actually uh, eat healthily instead of just not eating the wrong things. So there's, uh, there's um, a lot of learning that went on. I was involved in my pro um, transition, but... I thank the Lord that it was easy for me. Now, for some people, I realize that it's not that easy. So hopefully today, we're going to help to give us a little bit more of an understanding on why we eat like we do as Adventists, and um, hopefully help to provide a little bit of motivation for others to uh, change their diets if they need to. So in the key text, we have the scripture from 1 Thessalonians 4, chapter 4. And that says that every one of us should know how to possess our vessels in sanctification and honor, right? So we should know how to properly care for our bodies, in other words. We should know how to present our bodies a living sacrifice. And that's in Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, you know this one? By the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Is God, when they had the Old Testament times and they had the, uh, the lamb offering, was God happy with a lamb offering, with an offering that was sickly, now, what if the farmer, he said, oh, I'll keep the good cattle for myself and I'll just give God the ones that are all diseased or broken. No, God's not happy with that. And it's the same with us. He doesn't desire us to be unhealthy. He doesn't desire us to be sick. In fact, in 3 John verse 2, God said, he desires us to be as healthy as our soul is healthy. Therefore, physically healthy as we are spiritually healthy. He desires that for us. And so he's given us a way to be healthy. Now, just uh, one point, can diet save us? If I do all my power, put all my effort into keeping a healthy diet, becoming a vegan, all these sorts of things, do, giving, getting every little nutrient that I need, getting the sunlight, getting the right um, frame of mind every day, is this going to help me get to heaven? No, it's not. Not really. It might, it might make your, um, your path a little bit easier, <laughs> but it's not going to get you to heaven. Keeping... Um, keeping healthy is not what the way you earn your salvation. There's no way to earn your salvation. It's only through Jesus Christ. However, if we are neg negligent in our diet, can it condemn us? Yes. Are you sure? Yeah. If I just if I want to continue to eat the way I want to eat, even though God said do it this way, will that affect my salvation? In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, the Bible says, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. Now, if you look uh, in the text there, the word defile and the word destroy are the same word. So you can say it this way. If any man destroy the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. So he's giving us a warning here. If we defile or destroy this temple... It's going to result in our destruction. And also in Revelation 21.8, sorry, Revelation 21.8, the Bible says, the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire with burneth, with, which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now the key word in there is murderers. Now, I might not put a gun to my head. I might not hang myself. But I can live in a manner that is effectively committing suicide. Just a long, protracted process of suicide. So we have to be very careful in the way we treat our bodies. Am I living the, the way that God wants me to live? Because if we're not, we really have to uh, in, examine ourselves and see what we can do to rectify that. This here in Ministry of Healing, 
says, whatever affects the body has a corresponding effect on the mind and the soul. So the way we live not only affects our body, if our body is affected, our mind is affected. And if our mind is affected, now our soul is affected, our spirit, now our spirituality, our life with Jesus Christ. So we have to be careful to keep everything in tune and in balance. Does that make sense? Those who indulge appetite and passion and close their eyes to the light for fear they will see sinful indulgences which they are unwilling to forsake are guilty before God. Now I've heard people say before, or maybe I've said it also, that someone has a talk on, uh, on a particular um, aspect of diet and because it's talking about the aspect that they like, they don't want to listen to it so they won't hear it. So they'll say, oh, God winks at ignorance. Is that right? Well, he, wink, he winks at ignorance, but does he wink at willful ignorance? No, no, sir. So we have to make sure that when, if we have light before us and it's from God, that we don't close our eyes or harden our hearts to that light. Because if we do, we're guilty before God. Now, what is the perfect diet? There's a, there's a multitude of diets around. There are, there's all sorts of um, ones with special names like the Atkins and the Paleo and I don't know all of them. But basically it comes down to three types. We can say there are three types of diet. Carnivorous, omnivorous, and herbivorous. Now, carnivorous, there's a couple classes in here. You can eat all meat, anything you want. Pigs and mice and dogs. Actually, actually, um, I was, talking, I was uh, talking to my Filipino workmates, and they said, oh, when you go to the Philippines, you have to go to Humilis, because there, then you can eat the dog and you can eat the cobra. Yeah, they said it's aphrodisiac, because it makes your blood hot. It's, it's a stimulant, in other words. So... There's a diet where you can eat anything you want. You can also eat clean meats only. And that's what a lot of Adventists choose to do. Just eat you know, the ones that God allowed in the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Now, obviously Adventists were going to eat herbs as well. So they're not entirely carnivores. So I'm just saying that there, maybe there are people that eat only clean meats, but probably few and far between. Most of the Adventists will eat clean meats and um, the plant foods. Pescatarian. Anyone know what pescatarian is? Yeah, it's fish, plants and fish, right? So they'll say, okay, I'll cut out, I, I recognize the evils of red meat and maybe chicken and turkey and all that, but I'll still eat fish. Yeah, okay, that's a, that's a choice of some. Then you have the over-lacto-vegetarian, and they'll say, I'll cut out the fish, the chicken, and the red meat, but I'll still eat eggs and milk, eggs and dairy, right. And then you have the ovo-vegetarian, and they'll say, we'll cut out the milk, we'll cut out the... The meats, and but we will only eat vegetarian uh, plants and eggs. How many herbivorous diets do you think? Is that even the way you say it? Herbivorous? I don't know. How many diets for the herbivore are there, do you think? How many classes? Two. Two. What are they? Sorry? Only plants. How many types of diet will only include plants? Huh? Vegan, I hear. Okay. Any others? Huh? Vegetarian. What? What's the difference between vegan and vegetarian? Yeah, we're not talking about dairy products. We're talking about only plants. Only vegan? Is that the only one? Ah, there's another one. It's fruitarian. Oh, fruitarian. So it's only fruits. <laughs> it's only fruits, okay? So no vegetables. What foods were our bodies designed for? Genesis 1.29. What is that, sister? Yeah. So originally, when God placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, he gave them fruit and grains and nuts. That's it. Just fruit. They were fruit Aryans. But then after sin, what happened? Vegetables were added. You'll till the soil now. Look at this quote in the Ministry of Healing, 295. In order to know what are the best foods, we must study God's original plan for man's diet. He who created man and who understands his needs appointed Adam his food. Behold, he said, I have given you every herb yielding seed and every tree which, in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for food. Upon leaving Eden... To gain his livelihood by telling the earth under the curse of sin, man received permission to eat also the herb of the field. Because before that was just for the animals. 
Now God says, now it's for you as well. So grains, fruits, nuts and vegetables constitute the diet chosen for us by our Creator. These foods prepared in as simple and natural a manner as possible are the most healthful and nourishing. So what diet is the diet that God desires for us today? Is it the carnivorous diet? Herbivorous? Which one? Um, the <laughs> we call it vegan, but let's just call it... Okay, well... Yeah, I kind of... There's no other name. Let's say vegan for now. We don't want to get associated with like the people that don't eat honey and all this sort of thing, but... Anyway. Again and again, I have been trying... I have been shown... So this is a direct revelation from God. I have been shown that God is trying to lead us back step by step to His original design, which was... Genesis 129 with the added vegetables. That man should subsist upon the natural products of the earth. Now notice here, there's a couple of key words. Original design. Eventually, we're going to be in heaven, right? And we maybe we'll have the fruitarian diet in heaven. I'm not too sure. Because it says the leaves are given for the healing of the nations, right? So maybe we'll still have some vegetables. I don't know. But uh, and what we can know for sure is that God wants us to eat the way they ate in Eden. Obviously, after sin, it's the same... Um, Sorry? They eat banana in heaven? Mana. Mana. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So God wants us to eat his original plan diet for us, which is Genesis 129 and Genesis 3.18. Fruits and vegetables and grains and nuts. Notice here, though, the word step by step. Let's not jump into extreme uh, measures, right? This is what I did when I first uh, heard about the uh, diet reform. I just cut out everything that involved animals, but I didn't know what to replace them with. So we have to be intelligent and do things step by step. That's why in Councils on Health, it advises us to let the diet reform be progressive. What does progressive mean? Going up, right, improving, right? So if you draw, if you drew a graph, it might look like this. Going up, you know, you can start from down here and you're going to reach a higher point. Now notice that not only does it reach a higher point, you're aiming upwards, but it also continually is aiming upwards, right? You never get to a point where it's flatlining, right? You're always trying to improve. I'm going to show you. So say you start with all meat. Oh, hang on. Put all, that, put, put all our diets on here. Say you start with all meat. Now, the next thing, first thing, obviously, you're going to do is throw away those things that are really harmful. You have to, right? Like the pork and the mice and the dogs and the cobra. Go throw those ways. And maybe you'll move into clean meats, and then you might go to just the fish. Then you might just go eggs, milk, and vegetarian. Then you might just go eggs and vegetarian. Fine, you might end up vegan. And maybe if we get to heaven, I'm not sure. We might be fruitarian. I'm not too sure about that one. But notice how there's a progression. We're not going backwards. We're not going um, flatlining. We're not staying um, stationary. We're always improving. We're progressing. So, all meat. Was there a time when... All meat was a prescribed diet for mankind? After the flood, could, could man eat every food, um, flesh food after the flood? Only clean animals. Look at this. The tissues of the swine, that's pigs, swarm with parasites. Of sw The swine god said, it is unclean unto you. You shall not eat of their flesh, nor touch their dead carcass. This command was given because the swine's flesh is unfit for food. Swine are scavengers, and this is the only use they were intended to serve. Never, under any circumstances, was their flesh to be eaten by human beings. It is impossible for the flesh of any living creature to be wholesome when, it's, when filth is its natural element and when it feeds upon every detestable thing. Mm -hmm. So never was the swine or the pig supposed to be eaten. So the all-meat diet, we can rule that one out. We should... Immediately get rid of that one. Now, clean meats. Is there um, a situation where you might have to eat clean meats? When I say clean, I mean things that aren't really filthy like the pig and the mice and that. Some people say, oh, I need clean meat in order to get, to, um, I go to the gym, you know, I need to get my muscle up, I need the meat, the protein. It is a mistake to suppose that muscular strength depends upon the use of animal food. The needs of the system can be better supplied and more vigorous health 
can be enjoyed without its use. So for those bodybuilders who think they need the meat to give them the protein, they're wrong. They're wrong from the Word of God or from the inspired word, uh, writings of Adam White. Those who eat flesh are but eating grains and vegetables at second hand. For the animal receives from these things the nutrition that produces growth. The life that was in the grains and the vegetables passes into the eater. We receive it by eating the flesh of the animal. How much better to get it direct by eating the food that God provided for our use. Does that make sense? Yeah, the, the cow, the elephant, the hippo, they, they eat a lot of plant material, right? And they're huge and powerful. Yeah. So should we eat them to get huge and powerful or should we eat what they eat? Maybe not exactly. We might be out like Nebuchadnezzar and chewing the grass. I'm not saying. <laughs> we need to eat intelligently, though, right? Intelligently. If the Lord had not furnished all that is essential in the vegetable world, there would be an excuse for meat eating. But animals are now so diseased that it is now really dangerous, and it is unclean to eat meat. So, if there was anything that we needed from the animal world. God would have included it in the plant kingdom, right? If he wanted us to get protein, uh, if, sorry, if we needed to get protein from the animal world, he would have given it to us in the vegetable world. There's nothing. If we needed to get vitamin A, he would he will give it to us in the vegetable world. Vitamin B12, vitamin D, everything comes from the vegetable world and obviously other, like the sun and all that sort of stuff. But if there's anything in meats, that God required us to have, we would have an that we needed to get from meat, we would have an excuse to eat meat. But God said it is really dangerous to eat meat now. And everything is provided in the vegetable kingdom. Okay, so that's all meats and clean meats. Let's go to pescatarian. Shall we progress from clean meats to pescatarian? Or shall we progress further from pescatarian? Well, look at this quote. In many places, fish become so contaminated by the filth on which they feed as to be a cause of disease. This is especially the case when fish come into contact with the sewage of large cities. The fish that feed are fed on the contents of the drains may pass into distant waters and may be caught where the water is pure and fresh. Thus, when used as food, they bring disease and death on those who do not suspect the danger. Now, there was a time, I'm, I believe, anyway, Jesus ate fish. And I believe there was a time when it wasn't so harmful to, to consume fish. But today, we're told that the fish are contaminated. Even most fish, it doesn't say all fish, but most fish are contaminated. And you know, there's a special word for, you know, the parole? There's a special word for that fish that my cousin Tony told me. Say it. No, I cannot say it. <laughs> but, it but it relates to the sewage where it feeds. Sewage, so yeah. Just be aware on the dangers of fish eating also. Let's progress. Over like their veg. This is the um, eggs and milk, right? Plus plant foods. Should we stay here or should we progress further? Well, we're going to cover these both at once because they're pretty much linked together. Most people give up both of them or... Well, some people give up milk before they give up eggs, but anyway. Just a, a quick point out. A quick point to make, sorry. There are poor families whose diet consists largely of bread and milk. They have little fruit and cannot afford to purchase the nut fruit foods. In teaching health reform, as in all other gospel work, we are to meet the people where they are. So if people, are, they only have bread and milk in their cupboards, are we going to go to their house and say, you can't eat milk? Well, no, because now they, all they got is bread, right? We need to meet people where they are. So we need to teach people uh, according to their circumstance. Now, in saying that, are there many people around that you know that only have milk in their cupboards? Only sister? <laughs> yeah, so in that case, there is a reason there to eat meat, uh, to eat milk. And actually, well, it seemed like a slip, but look at this one. I have seen families whose circumstances would not permit them to furnish their table with healthful food. Unbelieving neighbors have sent them portions of meat from animals recently killed. They have made soup of the meat and supplied their large families of children with meals of bread and soup. It was not my duty, nor did I think it was the duty of anyone else to lecture them upon the, the evils of meat eating. I feel sincere pity for families who have newly come to the faith and who are so pressed with poverty that they know not from whence the next meal is coming. It is not my duty to discourse to them on healthful eating. So if meat even is all they have, we shouldn't go to them and preach to them that they shouldn't eat meat. 
Yeah, does that make sense? It's obvious, right? Of course. If, if, if we say you can't eat mean that's all they have, they're going to have nothing. Yeah, yeah. So we have to meet people where they are. And saying that, a lot of people, I, went, I don't know if this is going to Australia, but when I went to Australia, there's a lot of people who eat milk and eggs still, and I'm pretty sure they're not starving and only have milk and eggs to eat. So there's all, we can't use these situations as an excuse to justify our own habits, right? So we have to be careful. If we have opportunity to have other foods and more healthful foods, we should take that opportunity and not close our eyes to the light. And one more thing, eggs contain properties which are remedial agencies in counteracting poisons. So eggs are beneficial in some circumstances. I know a lady in... Um, uh, starts with M, Meta Meta. Matter, matter. She had all her fillings removed, mercury fillings, and the doctor put her on a high butter and high egg, and I think dairy diet, in order to remove the heavy metals from her system. And I learned this actually in university. These things, they bind with certain chemicals like heavy metals, and then they pass from the system and they take the heavy metals with them. So there are remedial properties in eggs. And in fact, uh, there was a, a guy at my work, and uh, one of my other workmates had, you know those fluoro tubes, the big fluorescent lights? He came up and goes, Psh, smash it on his back. And I'm thinking, well, that's full of mercury. <laughs> well, they used to be anyway, I'm not too sure if they are now. But uh, the, he's not going to go and take an, um, a, a liter of charcoal water, right? So the best thing for him to do is to eat some eggs, eat some, drink some milk, and get some butter in him, you know, and try and pass that mercury out. Again, though, just because they have beneficial qualities doesn't mean we should use this as an excuse for our habit, right? We don't say, oh, the eggs are healthy, therefore I'm eating them. No, this is for when you're poisoned. <laughs> now, look at it. Now we're going, to get, we're going to get into the explicit text. The time could come. The time will come when we may have to discard some of the articles of diet we now use, such as milk, and cream and eggs. Now this is a little bit confusing, right? Because it says will, the time will come, and then it says when we may have to discard these products. And if you read the um, councils on diet and foods, this is the sort of quote that they'll put in the, in the author's and the publisher's preface, and they'll say, she said it might happen, and therefore they recommend the lacto-ovo diet in the, in the councils on diet and foods. But is this really what Alan White said? Did she say that it might happen, it might not happen? Well, remember, we have to take, when we're, when we're looking at the Bible, right, we have to take the whole Bible. And we're also, when we're looking at the Spirit of Prophecy, we have to take all the quotes. Now, she said the time will come when we may have to discard in this, in this passage. Then she said, but I wish to say that when the time comes that it is no longer safe to use milk, cream, butter, and eggs, God will reveal this. Is this a maybe now? Does she say, I wish to say that if the time comes that it is no longer safe to use milk, cream, and butter, God will reveal it. When the time comes. Now, don't worry, there's a lot more quotes um, that are very specific, but I'm just going to use this one for now. What is God going to do when the time comes that it's time for us to discard these items? What is he going to do according to this quote? He's going to let us know. He's going to let us know that eggs and milk are no longer safe. Right? This is in 1873. She said, We have always used a little milk and some sugar. This we have never denounced, either in our writings or in our preaching. We believe cattle will become so much diseased that these things will yet be discarded. But the time has not yet come for sugar and milk to be wholly abolished from, her ta from our tables. So in other words, back in 1873, the time wasn't there when these things, God had not revealed that it was unsafe to eat them, right? But what is she saying here? We believe cattle will become. Now people will say, oh look, this is just her belief. Keep reading. The light given me is that it will not be very long before we shall have to give up any animal food. This is the light given me. It will not be very long before we shall have to give up any animal food. Even milk will have to be discarded. 
Diseases rapidly, is accumulating rapidly. The curse of God is upon the earth because man has cursed it. That was in 1899. The diet reform should be progressive. As disease in animals increases, the use of milk and eggs will become more and more unsafe. An effort, this is what we should do now, an effort should be made to supply their place with other things that are helpful and inexpensive. The people everywhere should be taught how to cook without milk and eggs so far as possible and yet have their food wholesome and palatable. So do you think it's a maybe God's going to remove this eggs and milk from our diet? It's a definite, right? It's, it's obvious. And not only is that, is she saying it's going to happen in the future, she's saying we need to do something now. We need to learn how to use, how to eat without these things and we need to teach people how to eat without these things. It's very clear. Let the diet reform be progressive. Progressive, remember? Remember that word. Progressive. We have to keep on moving upwards. Let the people be taught how to prepare food without the use of milk or butter. Tell them that the time will soon come when there will be no safety in using eggs, milk, cream, or butter. Because disease in animals is increasing in proportion to the increase of wickedness among men. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. She said this to a doctor. Dr. Rand, educate yourself to discard all flesh meat. Soon, butter will never be recommended, and after a time, milk will be entirely discarded. For disease in animals is increasing in proportion to the increasing increase of wickedness among men. The time will come when there will be no safety in using eggs, milk, butter, or cream. Very clear, huh? The time is going to come from back in her day, as yet future, it's going to come when we're not to eat these things. So when the Councils on Diet of Food publishes, they say the milk and egg diet and, and, and vegetarian diet is the best diet for mankind. Are they correct? They are in direct opposition to what the Spirit is telling us. The correct diet is the one that God implemented in Eden. Right? Genesis 1.29 and Genesis 3.18. Fruits, nuts, vegetables, and grains. That's the correct diet. And, it's, and back in her day, it was yet future, but it was going to definitely happen. Has it come now, though? This is the big question everyone wants to know. Are we at that time yet? Has God revealed that milk and eggs are unsafe to eat? Let's start with eggs. This is in the U.S. Food and Drug Administration government website in the USA. Egg-associated illness caused by salmonella is a serious public health problem. Infected, infected individuals may suffer mild to severe gastrointestinal illness, short-term or chronic arthritis, or even death. <laughs> Do you think it's safe to eat something that might cause your death? This is from the government. Now, we, we have to be careful when we're listening to government websites because, you know, they can be... Mm, a little bit persuaded sometimes, maybe either way. Fresh eggs, even those with clean, uncracked shells, may contain bacteria called salmonella that can cause foodborne illness, often called food poisoning. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration estimates that 79,000 cases of foodborne illness and 30 deaths each year are caused by eating eggs contaminated with salmonella. They say, oh, it's only 80,000 amongst 320 million. It's only 30 amongst 320 million. That's not so bad, right? The point is, these are the people that died. These are the people that got sick. It doesn't mean to say that the people who didn't die and didn't get sick weren't eating um, poison food. They weren't eating bacteria-laced eggs. You know, It's just that they didn't die from it. So don't get the idea that because people don't die that it's, not, that it's safe. That would be a bit ridiculous. Anyway, we've got a quote on that later anyway. Now... Um, okay, I'll briefly go through this. It's very easy to find out if you want to know if eggs uh, and milk or whatever are healthful or not. All you have to do is go to Google Scholar or PubMed and just search um, pathogens, eggs, pathogens, milk, diseases, eggs, bacteria, egg, all this. And you'll come up with all the scientific articles about eggs and their diseases. Now, I've got, I just pulled one up here. This took me like five minutes. I've got an app on my phone. It took me like five minutes. I didn't have to, didn't, didn't have to pay for it. I just read the ab abstract. That's like a summary of the article. And so we're going to look at two, two part portions of the summary of that, not the actual article itself. We're going to read it, sorry, but yeah, just to give you an idea. Eggs are important to the diet of Canadians. This product is one of the supply-managed commodities in Canada, but unlike other commodities, 
whose food safety risks are extensively explored and reported, information on the prevalence of enteric organisms, e.g. Salmonella, Campylobacter, and antimicrobial resistance in layers in Canada are limited. So they're saying that information about the diseases in eggs is limited in Canada. So this study was conducted to determine the prevalence of select bacteria and associated antimicrobial resistance patterns. So they did a study that they're going to say, we're going to look at the, the egg industry and we're going to see how much disease is actually in it. So what they did, we're not going to read all this, but what they did, they took um, data from three different sites, one, two in Ontario and one in BC. And just looking at the, the outcomes here, you can see uh, salmonella prevalence was in 29% of the eggs in one, in one farm. 8% in the other and 7% in BC and one Ontario farm. That's scary though. 30, almost a third of all eggs were contaminated with some. This isn't some food market in the middle of Wuhan, right? This is Canada. This is a, a Western, a, th a first world country and 30% of this farm's eggs were infected with salmonella that can cause death, at least cause, can cause sickness and at least is unhealthful. Now, um, we'll go down to Campylobacter. Look at this. It's not detected in BC, but was isolated from 89% of one farm. 89%. And, and look at down at the bottom here. Uh, e. coli, you know, the very famous E. coli, was high in both sample types, 98%. These food items are filled with filthy microbes. Filled with them. But wait, then someone will say, but wait, that's the cage hens, right? What about free range? Isn't that healthy? And again, just search in, in the Google Scholar or whatever you use. And I found this study, microbi uh, microbiological contamination of shell eggs produced in conventional and free range housing systems. The present study was conducted to determine microbiological contamination of free range and conventional chicken eggs produced under controlled con conditions. So they did a study to compare free range and caged chickens, right? Mm -hmm. So surely the free range, you know, they're out in the grass, out in the open air, the sunshine, that's surely they're healthier, right? Yeah, it makes sense. But look at this, the summary of the article. These da data demonstrate that free range eggs where hens have more contact with eggs after overposition, that means after they lay the egg, have greater microbiological contamination on the egg shell surface than eggs produced in the battery cage systems. So the free range were actually more contaminated than the um, caged hens. This is because after they lay the egg in the nest, they sit on it for longer. And then it has more opportunity for fecal matter to infect the egg. So free range is actually not a better option. Because, and actually, in battery hens, they do a lot of, uh, it's, it's not good either, but they use a lot of antibiotics and sprays and things to keep the um, pathogen prevalence down. But yeah, that has its own problem. So when we're talking about eggs, has God revealed to us that there are problems and safety issues in eating eggs? He has. We know it now. We know. We know that so many illnesses are caused by eggs. Milk now. Sorry, sorry, but we have to go to milk. Raw milk and products are ma made from it, however, can pose severe health risks, including death. This is raw milk we're talking about. This is from the Centers for De Disease Control, CDC in, in the USA, another government website. Can pose severe health risks, including death. This is raw milk. Now, what about pasteurized milk, right? Pasteurized milk, this is a CDC, pasteurized milk that is correctly handled in the dairy, bottled, sealed, and refrigerated after pasteurization, and that is properly handled by the consumer, is very unlikely to contain illness causing germs. So they're saying raw milk can kill you, but pasteurized milk, that's where they've cooked it to kill the uh, microbes, is very unlikely to contain any illness causing germs. And I thought about this, and I think, why didn't they just say germs? Why did they say illness causing germs here? Right, because you can eat germs and not get sick, right? You can get, eat germs and not get ill. But notice the conditions also that are required to not get ill. You, it has to be correctly handled in the dairy, has to be correctly bottled, has to be correctly sealed, has to be correctly refrigerated, and then it has to be properly handled. So all these conditions take, um, determine whether or not the milk is going to be bad for you or good for you. 
And if it meets all those conditions, it's very unlikely to contain illness-causing germs. But does it contain germs just the same? So I look up another study. Foodborne pathogens in milk and the dairy farm environment. No, we're not going to read. Oh, I hope we're not going to read that. Okay, just read some of it. Milk and products derived from milk of dairy cows can harbor a variety of microorganisms and can be important sources of foodborne pathogens. The presence of foodborne pathogens in milk is due to direct contact with contaminated sources in the dairy farm environment and to, and to excretion from the udder of an infected animal. Most milk is pasteurized, so why should the dairy industry be concerned about the microbial quality of bulk tank milk? Now, there are several reasons. So they're saying milk does contain pathogens, does contain these microbes that cause you illness, but if pasteurization cleanses the milk, why does the dairy industry worry about the microorganisms? Or why do they take samples from your, from your milk tanks and, and test them for the microbes? Why are they worried about it if, if, it's, all, if it's all destroyed in the pasteurization? Now, they give some, um, some points here. Number one, outbreaks of disease in humans have been traced with the consumption of unpasteurized milk and have been also traced back to pasteurized milk. All right, so pasteurized milk has caused disease. Unpasteurized milk, number two, unpasteurized milk is consumed directly by dairy producers, farm employ employees, and families, their neighbors, and raw milk advocates. So there are people who still drink raw milk. And that's, remember, the CDC said that can cause your death or at least severe illness. It's very bad for you. But there are people who still drink. So the dairy industry is still interested in, that, uh, in the microbes in milk for that reason. Number three, unpasteurized milk is consumed directly by a large segment of the population via consumption of several types of cheeses manufactured from unpasteurized milk. So the milk might be clean, but the cheese is filthy. Okay, number four. Entry, into foodborne path entry of foodborne pathogens via contaminated raw milk into dairy food processing plants can lead to persistence of these pathogens in biofilms. That means the, um, the bacteria will create like a shield over itself that it, ca it cannot be destroyed. And this is what, what, this is what it can happen in dairy processing plants. And subsequent contamination of processed milk products and exposure of, cons uh, sorry, and exposure of consumers to pathogenic bacteria. So if they've got a big shield over them, they're not going to die. They're going to survive the pasteurization process, and they're going to infect the consumer. And number five, related to it, pasteurization may not destroy all foodborne pa pathogens in milk. And number six, inadequate or faulty pasteurization will not destroy or foodborne pathogens. So when the CDC gave their list of conditions, they said if it's handled correctly, bottled correctly, all this, those are the problems. <laughs> those are the problems with pasteurized milk is because it's not always handled properly. It's not always pasteurized properly. There are contamination factors. It's not 100% uh, um, clear and certain that you're going to get a perfectly clean glass of milk when you pour it from the tub. It cannot be. It cannot be. And the fact that we know these pathogens are in there to start with should be a concern to us anyway. Furthermore, pathogens such as Listeria mono, monocytogen, monocytogenes can survive and thrive in a post-pasteurization processing environments, thus leading to recontamination of dairy products. These pathways pose a risk to the consumer from direct exposure to foodborne pathogens present in unpasteurized dairy products as well as dairy products that have beca that become recontaminated after pasteurization. Okay, so that was a big mouthful, right? Sorry about that. But basically it's saying pasteurized milk is bad for you. Oh, sorry, unpasteurized milk is really bad for you. Pasteurized milk can be bad for you still. And the fact that we're eating stuff that is filled with microorganisms, even though they're dead, should sicken us anyway. But we'll say, wait a minute, I don't get sick every time I eat milk and eggs. Or any time I've eaten milk and eggs, I've never gotten sick. Does that mean they're healthy? Does that mean they're safe? Look at this. The effects of a flesh diet may not be immediately re realized, but this is no evidence that it is not harmful. This is talking about meat now. So you can eat meat and not get sick, right? But that doesn't mean that it's not harming you. Few can be made to believe that it is the meat they have eaten which has poisoned their blood and caused their suffering. Many die of diseases wholly due to meat eating, while the real cause is not suspected by themselves or others. So in other words, they're going to eat meat, they're not going to get sick straight away, but their blood is still poisoned and they're still going to suffer in the future. And the same thing happens if we eat other contaminated foods. We might not get sick straight away, we not, might not go to A&E, might not get the food poisoning. I've had the, you know, the other send, the other send, it's terrible. But we might not have that. However, it's still having an effect on our body, on our temples. 
Now, the second, so that was a big thing. How do we know when it's time to give up milk and eggs? Number one reason was God will reveal when it's unsafe, right? Number two, God will provide a substitute. He will. We see that cattle are becoming greatly diseased. The earth itself is corrupted. We know that the time will come when it is not best to use milk and eggs. But that time has not yet come. We know that when it does come, the Lord will provide. The question is asked, meaning much to all concerned, will God set a table in the wilderness? I think the answer may be yea. God will provide for his people. So he's saying if the time comes when milk and eggs have to be discarded, God is going to replace them. He will provide a replacement. In all parts of the world, provision will be made to supply the place of milk and eggs. All parts of the world. Notice that. And the Lord will let us know when the time comes to give up these articles. He desires all to free feel that they have a gracious Heavenly Father who will instruct them in all things. The Lord will give dietic art and skill to His people in all parts of the world, teaching them how to use for sustenance of life the products of the earth. So the second sign is, oh, we'll just read this one quote. The time is near when because of the iniquity of the fallen race, the whole animal creation will groan under the diseases and that curse our earth. God will give his people ability and tact to prepare wholesome food without these things. Let our people discard all unwholesome recipes. So in other words, God's going to reveal it by have, through science telling us that this thing is unsafe. And he's also going to reveal it by giving us a replacement, a substitute, an alternative. We know that God's revealed through science the pathogens in milk, eggs, and meat. Has he provided a substitute? What other substitute do you think? Okay. Nuts and nut foods are coming largely into use to take the place of flesh meats. This is not milk and eggs, by the way. This is to take the place of flesh meats. With nuts, maybe combined grains, roots, or fruits, and some roots to make foods that are healthful and nourishment. Now, I'll read this quote, and you can get experimental. You say, oh, what can I make? I can take the nuts and I can mix it with grains like, uh, I don't know, rice or maybe um, flour and some fruits, maybe put the fruits in there. Just You can experiment, right? And you can make something from these simple plant-based ingredients that will take the place of flesh meats. Light has been given me that almonds are preferable to peanuts, but peanuts in limited quantities may be used in connection with grains to make nourishing food, which can be cared for by the digestive organs. Because some people will say, well, I can't afford Brazil nuts and almonds and walnuts and pecans and all these things. But the Spirit of God says that peanuts can be used to make nourishing food. Yeah, if you can get almonds, use almonds, but don't discard peanuts because they're peanuts. You know, people look down on peanuts, but they're really a, they're really a, a gift from God. They're in just about every country. They're so cheap and, and um, abundant, and they're so amazing to use in food. And I'll, I'll show you at the end if we have no, we don't have time. But anyway, let's read this last, last part here. Let all who can eat freely of fruit. Oh, let all who can eat freely of fruit. Fruits and grains are preferable to nuts. So don't make the fact that you can't get walnuts an excuse for eating milk, eggs, and meat, right? Eat the fruit. Eat your grains first. That's the most important thing. And if you can get peanuts, that's even better. If you can't, don't worry too much. We'll go into why in a minute. I've been instructed that nut foods are often used unwisely, that too large a proportion of nuts is used. So a lot of times, you know, if you, do you know how many Brazil nuts it takes to meet the dietary um, recommended dietary intake of selenium. One. Yeah. And do you know how many um, Brazil nuts it takes to exceed the toxicity level? I can't remember. <laughs> but it's less than six. Right? So you, you can get selenium toxicity from Brazil nuts. Peanuts, I used to get pimples. I said, why do I get pimples from peanuts? It's because I eat too many. My body's saying, it's too much. Get out. We have to be careful on how, much, how many nuts we eat. Look at this. Look, look what Ellen White, this is her practice. We eat no meat or butter and use very little milk in cooking. There is no fresh fruit at this season. We have a good yield of tomatoes, but our family think much of the nuts prepared in a variety of ways. We use one-fifth as much as the recipe specifies. So the, if, the, if the recipe specifies one cup of nuts, she's going to use a fifth of a cup. That's how little nuts we need. We don't need hardly any. So when people say, oh, the nuts are so expensive, 
I can I, I have to buy a Brazil nuts that cost seven dollars and I only get about thirty. Well that'll last you for a month, even more, maybe two months, because you don't need them every day. You're eating other things as well. So just be careful on using the, the if we have nuts that are not so readily available to us, don't use that as an excuse also to eat eggs and milk and meat because there's no reason to. Now, far out. We're just going to go through them. Have you ever all heard of Madison College? The school that Ellen White, she sailed down the river with Ed Edward Sutherland and she said, oh, that is the land that God wants for his school. And it was about 400 acres of rocks. <laughs> and the men cried because they didn't want to, they, they said, what a terrible wasteland. But it ended up being the most, um, uh, you read, you read um, um, God's, uh, I can't remember, just look up Madison School anyway. It's the most amazing story behind it. Like they had, they, they started food factories, hospitals, um, it, was med it was a medical school as well. Like students would come from all over the country. They didn't have to pay fees. They worked for, for their tuition six hours a day. They studied and I think they worked as well at, during that six hours. And that was, their, that was the way they got their education. And it was a, an amazing success. And it sprouted up all over the south of, of, of the United States. Little schools everywhere. It was an amazing success. Guess what was invented at Madison College? Now remember, we talked about nut foods being a replacement for meat, right? But do they replace milk and eggs? Do we have any guesses what this is? Yeah, it's a soybean. Soybean was the miracle of the 1930s. In 1970, we'll just go through the history a little bit. 1917, they, at, at Madison College, they first grew them and they ate them at the school. 1922, they started to create um, soybean products. And sell them. 1922, they okay, that's the same. They can the soybeans as well. 1929, they started making fresh. Now, tofu has been known in Asia for centuries, right? The Japanese, I don't know how long I've been eating it, but it only really blew up in America in the 1930s. And it started with a little old Seventh Day Adventist college. Not necessarily the, the very, very first one, but this was the really successful fresh food um, soy factory. Fresh tofu and soy milk were served in the school in 1929. And 1931, the tofu was being sold. Now, they called it soy cheese, but it was just tofu. But they started selling it commercially in 1931. And 1931, also, they started bringing out soy milk in big quantities. And then we had the veg roast, which is like a steak for, for vegetarians. And then we had the soy burger in 1938, soy burger loaf. Now, you will be amazed at the vitamin and mineral content of these soy products. Now, the soy gets a lot of heat today, but do you know why? It's because the meat, egg, and milk industries hate it. Why is that? Because it is, um, it exceeds them. It, it is superior to their products. Look at this. In the left, one on the left is the egg, one on the right is tofu. Look at the, in the red arrows there, if you're eating eggs, you're getting 15% of your daily intake of fat, saturated fat, um, cholesterol, 124% of your daily limit of cholesterol is in two eggs. You've, you've exceeded your limit already, so you've got no, nothing else with, with cholesterol in it for the rest of the day. This is how that, that's what you're eating when you're eating eggs. Not to mention all the bacteria and the microbes and all that thing we've talked about already. Now look at, look at the bottom here. Uh, protein, okay, eggs have got a bit more protein, right? They do 25%, but look, the tofu's not that bad, 16%. And you, you get, you're eating other things as well, so. Sorry? Right, so, yeah, so because you're eating a lot of other proteins with, the, with your meal, you're not just eating tofu as your only meal. Oh, I do sometimes, but not often. So, okay, so you're still getting the protein. Look at this, you're getting more iron in tofu than you do in eggs. Look at that, you've got 10% in eggs, you've got 30% of your daily requirement in tofu. Same goes for calcium, you've got 4% of your calcium in eggs, you get 27% in tofu, and the last one is phosphorus, so, yeah, you've got more in eggs than you do in tofu, but you still have something in tofu. And down the bottom here with selenium, you have more selenium in eggs than you do tofu, but not that much more. So everything that the eggs provide, tofu is a substitute and alternative. Maybe not to the greatest de degree, and into, in some areas, and to greater degree in others, but still, it's there, right? Look at soy milk compared to cow's milk, though. 
Look at all the bad things in cow's milk. You get in 23% in saturated fat, 8% of your cholesterol, 25 quarter of your daily sugars in cow's milk, in one cup of cow's milk. But look what's down the bottom here. Soy milk is, well, it's the same, pretty much the same protein. It has the same vitamin D. It has pretty much the same calcium and less phosphorus. But of these three, protein, vitamin D, and calcium, and it's actually got more iron, it's got 6% iron, and cow's milk's got none. So can you see that God's given us replacements that are either meat, exceed, or in some places at least are equivalent to the animal diet? So here, putting it in a graph, do eggs contain nutrition that I can't get from all these other things? Now, comparing eggs and tofu, look at the calcium, look at the iron, magnesium, and zinc. Do you, which is better on this graph? It's tofu. It's tofu. Easy. It just outshines it by a ton. By a ton. Look at the calcium in tofu. Now, this is the one. It's got similar vitamin A, but look at the vitamin B12. This is the big one, right? This is what everyone always talks about, vitamin B12. How long are you going to eat eggs for? Some will say, I need to eat eggs because I need the vitamin B, vitamin B12. How long are you going to eat eggs for? Oh, until I get the expensive nut foods. Wait. Do eggs, uh, nuts contain vitamin B12? No, they don't. Sorry. <laughs> no. Egg, nut, no plant food has vitamin B12 in it naturally occurring. You have to eat fermented things. Or, what's the other things that you can eat to get vitamin B12? Mushrooms or... Yeast, that's a good one. Fortified food is the one I was thinking of. Look at this here. Eggs versus tofu, right? Um, B12... Eggs outshines in a similar in other ways. If you get fortified tofu, which is kind of, there's a heap of fortified foods today, right? Everything's fortified. You can't miss it. Look at the, look at the content now. Which one do you want to eat? Do you want to eat the one filled with bugs, filled with cholesterol, filled with saturated fat, or do you want to eat the one filled with vitamins and minerals? Now, all over the world it said, in all parts of the world, God will make provision. These top four are from the Philippines. You know these all? You know these ones? You've eaten all these ones? I've had the sausages, the meat magic. I think that's all I've had. Sausages and the meat magic. They're good though. See? You like the sausage. These ones are New Zealand ones. Have you eaten nut lean, nut meat or casserole mints? Yeah. I like the nut meat, but uh, I do. Yeah, it's really bad for my workmates during the day. Let's just say that. <laughs> <laughs> but I really like the nut meat. But look at this. They all have fortified vitamin B. I'm not too sure about the Filipino ones, but all these ones have iron and B12 fortification. And tofu is there as well. So in all parts of the world, provision will be made to supply the place of milk and eggs. And the Lord will let us know when the time comes to give up these articles. How is he going to let us know? What two, two ways are we going to know? Number one, he's going to reveal that unsafe. What's the other way? <laughs> That's a quick way to learn. The other way is he's going to provide a substitute, an alternative, a better way. And look how he does this. The Lord will give dietetic art, dietetic art and skill to his people in all parts of the world. Now, there's some amazing cooks. I heard Pampanga is nice, but there's a, they, they can eat some very um, adventurous foods. But um, all over the world, God is giving wisdom, right? So when... The, the, to sum it all up, the time will come when we may have to discard some articles of diet which we now use, such as milk and cream and eggs. Wait until the circumstances demand it. How will the circumstances demand it? When it's unsafe to eat it and the Lord prepares a way for it. How will we prepare, prepare a way for it? By re providing a replacement. These two things. If he reveals it's unsafe to eat and he gives, him a, gives us a replacement, do we have any excuse to continue in our old ways. God says we want to be progressive in our diet reform. Just going to finish now. The grains with fruits, nuts and vegetables contain all the nutri nutritive properties necessary to make good blood. In grains, fruits and vegetables and nuts are to be found all the food elements that we need. Sorry Council on Diet and Foods Publishers, you're misleading the people, you're giving misinformation and it's terrible. You should read your books better. All the elements of... This is from the same book, by the way, all these quotes. How can they read this and then put it at the front? You need animal products. Anyway, the elements of, all the elements of nutrition are contained in the fruits, vegetables, and grains. 
grains, fruits, nuts and vegetables in proper combination contain all the elements of nutrition. In order to strengthen in them the moral perceptions, the love of spiritual things, we must regulate the manner of our living, dispense with animal food, and use grains, vegetables, fruits, and fruits as articles of food. That's what we want to do. But remember, it's progressive. Let's take it step by step. Let's not tread on each other and point fingers or anything like that. Let's just examine our own selves, our own lifestyles, and see what, where we can improve. God said, today, if you hear his voice, if you've been convicted today, don't harden your hearts as they did in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. What did they do? In the, what did the Israelites do in the wilderness when God fed them with manna? He gave them food. What did they do? They whinged and moaned. They said, no, we want the flesh pots of Egypt. And God sent them quails. And what did they do? They ate them. What happened? Thousands died in a day. Let's not be like the Israelites and harden our hearts when God gives us such a wonderful and bountiful provision to meet our every, day, every dietary need. Wherefore, therefore, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, let's do it all to the glory of God. Amen. Amen. We'll close our service now with song number 275.